Bibles, and let's go to Genesis chapter 28. We finally got to all the other times that we've been studying since probably all the, ever since Abraham talked to Melchizedek. We, we, we're, we're looking at the Bible and we're looking at some amazing prophecies, but what part of the prophecy that we're looking at is the two cities that are, uh, um, that the Bible just from Genesis to Revelation keep going over, and that is Babylon is, seems to be the seat uh, where Satan has established uh, his, his uh, battleground on the earth, and God is choosing out Abraham and giving him a promised land because God's eyes are upon the land uh, that he's going to give to Abraham called the land of Canaan that will eventually be the land of Israel. Um, but uh, at this point there's still strangers coming into that land, but there was a priest of Salem, a priest of the Most High God. There was a testimony of God before Abraham got to that land uh, where they did acknowledge who was the Most High, not Satan who wanted, desired to be the Most High. And uh, King of Salem, Salem is just a, was an ancient name for Jerusalem. Uh, but we've been looking at uh, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and, and we're looking at Jacob here because um, of all the, the, the Abrahamic covenant is going to be fulfilled through him, and yet rather than realizing that God is making a promise that he can just trust God for, he is conniving and cheating, stealing his brother, you know, his brother's birthright. They call it stealing. I don't see how you can steal something that God promises yours. Uh, but, it's the, but he had to at least, his dad wasn't going to pass it on to him. His dad was going to give it to his firstborn Esau. And Esau already despised his birthright, agreed to sell it to his brother. And then when it came time, time for the dad to pass it down, uh, uh, Rebekah and, and Jacob fooled Isaac into passing it down to Jacob. And, uh, and now Esau is, is ready to kill him, just waiting for his dad to die. And so they're sending Jacob away uh, under the pretense, but also f for the purpose of, of leaving the land down here. And he's in the very south of the land in, in Beersheba and go all the way up to Haran to his uncle's house and, and, uh, and then marry there uh, one of his daughters, um, and, and, and have a bride. So he's leaving Beersheba. He's on his way to Haran. We said last time that's 550 miles. And uh, so it's going to take him 28, 30 days to get there. Uh, but as you, as you begin chapter 28, I want to remind you a couple things, and then we'll look at the rest of what's in chapter 28. As he leaves, look at verse 10. This is where he departs. And before he departed, by the way, in verses 3 and 4, that covenant, uh, let me read that to you, uh, J, uh, Isaac reminds him that the covenant that was promised to Abraham that was given to Isaac is going to go to Jacob. And it says, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So he's going to make him a great, out of him a great nation. Through him the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And the land that God promised to Abraham, we call it the land of Canaan, it's this land here, is going to be given to him. Now I'm going to switch. You see the travel that he's got to do. He's, we're not going to get that far in his travel. In fact, we're not going to study his time in Haran. I didn't realize Wednesday that was behind there. So he's down here in Beersheba. And, and he's going to start traveling. He's got to go all the way through the land and, and beyond. But as he's traveling, verse 10 says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took the stones uh, of that place and put them for pillows. So he leaves, and, and now our attention is drawn to a certain place. As you're reading this, you would think that he is... He, he just, the first day out, he stopped and, and went to sleep. But actually, the where he's at, if you look at verse 19, it says, And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that place was called uh, Luz at the first. So he left Beersheba, and he got all the way up to Bethel here. Bethel is just 10 miles, where's your, there, it's just 10 miles north of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the center of the circle, and that's actually just under that circle, so it's just slightly less than 10 miles from Jerusalem. He got that far. Now, 
we know that's a three days journey because one of the things that we studied earlier is Abraham was down here in Beersheba and God told him to offer his son upon one of the mountains that he would show him of, show him. And so he traveled three days and saw where uh, a mountain Moriah, which is one of the mountains in Jerusalem. So Abraham was an old man. He traveled, got as far as Jerusalem. So this is like a three days, jour days journey. And now here, right near that same place, uh, just a little north of that place now, Bethel, is where Jacob is when he makes these stones in the pillows. I don't know why someone makes stones in the pillows, but <laughs> it just so, it sounds so hard to sleep on. Uh, but anyhow, that, he, he's up here at Bethel, and, uh, and he comes to that same place. Now, since you know the name of that place is Bethel, come back before we finish this, and look back in Genesis chapter 12. And the first thing, oh, yeah, and the first thing, this is where Abraham just finally comes into the land. He, he actually left Ur of the Chaldees, went to Haran. God had to call him a second time to leave Haran, come down to the promised land. He enters into the promised land. Verse 6 says, and Abraham passed through, is it, yeah, uh, Abraham passed through the land unto uh, the, the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Mori, and, uh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Um, and, and he moved from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai, uh, uh, Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called on the, on the name of the Lord. And Abraham's journeyed, uh, Abraham journeyed going still toward the south. He eventually goes to, uh, he goes all the way down into Egypt over here, but then he eventually comes back to the land, and if you look at chapter 13, um, in verse 3, it says, and he went on his journey from the south, so he went all the way down to Egypt, and now he comes back, and uh, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, hey, Ai, hey, <laughs> Uh, unto the place of the altar which he made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So you see that that Bethel was a place that Abram went back to. It's a place where Abram called on the name of the Lord. He, he, it, it's a statement of faith and trusting God for, for what God promised him for. And Abraham goes back to that place. I also want you to remember in verse 6 of chapter 12, when he first came into the land, he came unto the land, unto the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Mori. When he came, I don't think Sechem's going to be on here, but, but it's Mount Gizem. Oh, so it must be that Sikar is, is the ancient name. At least that's the, the same area where Sechem is. Abraham came from way up in Haran, came down through the land. When he got to this point is where, where we first picked up there, and then he journeyed from there and came to Bethel, then he went to, he went, yeah, a lot of movement. He went to, all the way to Egypt, and then came back and settled again in Bethel, eventually settled in Beersheba, where God called him to offer his son. So he's moving up and down, he's mostly staying in the south country, and uh, we picked up where he was up there. there I say that be, depending on how far we're gonna get now. But that Bethel was a special place. Go back to chapter 28. Now here, Jacob is, is in this place. He's, he's actually going to travel all the way through the land, but when he gets to this place called Bethel, uh, he makes a pillow and, uh, out of these stones, and as the verse, 28, uh, verse 11 ends, and lay down in that place to sleep. Verse 12 says, oh, that, yeah, it was verse 11. Verse 12 says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and, and, uh, and behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So there's the Lord's, the, the top of it's in heaven. So the Lord's on the top of it in heaven. 
and said, I am the, the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God, uh, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So here God is not just Isaac passing down and saying you're going to inherit this land. Now God appears to him and tells him that you're going to inherit that land. And, and you know, you, you hear the story and the, the phrase Jacob's ladder. Well, that's where it comes from. But Jacob has this dream. And I want you to see the detail in that dream is that when he sees the ladder set up, it's, it, it's a ladder that goes from earth to heaven. But, but when, it, when, it, when he sees it, it says at the, the end of verse 12, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now that's kind of strange, because where do angels live? Yeah, they're always called the angels of heaven. So why would angels ascend and descend? If angels are in heaven, wouldn't they descend and ascend? Because they would come down the ladder to earth, and then they would go up the ladder back into heaven. But it says it in reverse. Hold your place here and come over to John chapter 1. Now one of the things that we have the advantage of seeing so clearly at Grace Bible Church, because we rightly divide the word of truth, is we understand what the gospel of the kingdom is. And uh, especially this time of year, everyone's going to celebrate the Christ come, being born of the Virgin, coming into this earth. And, and they even will quote, peace on earth and goodwill to man. Uh, but without a full understanding and the reality that someday Jesus Christ is going to establish his reign on this earth. He's going to be king of the earth. And, uh, and when they, Israel and, and the world crucified him uh, and put above the, uh, above the cross king of the Jews and mocked the fact that he is a king, they didn't realize that he, had to, he surrendered himself to death because until he could die and pay for sins, there would be no one in his kingdom. But then he is coming back the second time as king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to establish his kingdom. And when he does, his kingdom is going to be established, first of all, in the land of Israel, and he's going to sit on the throne of David, which is eventually what you're going to see is placed in Jerusalem, and he's going to set up his reign here. So when he came into the world, he, he, he begins his ministry, and in John chapter 1, in verse uh, 43, it says, the day following, you already called Peter and Andrew, it said, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, follow me. And Philip, said, uh, and Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now, the Lord is not down here. Bethsaida is up here, the northern part of Galilee. And Jesus walked around the Sea of Galilee. That's where the twelve apostles are all being called from. He begins his ministry up there because Jesus is from Nazareth. That's where he was raised, born down here in Bethlehem, but had to live in obscurity so that people wouldn't kill him when he was a youth. Actually, he was in Egypt for a while, came back and was raised in Nazareth. So now he's walking around the Sea of Galilee, calling his twelve apostles, and eventually they come down to Jerusalem, and, and, and they minister back and forth. But, but just so that you know where, where he's at here, it says, so, so Philip is of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. And said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So they, when they said, We have found him whom, whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, throughout the Old Testament there is this acknowledgement that there's this seed of the woman that's going to come. That there is this Savior, this Messiah that's going to come for the nation of Israel. And, and a Messiah is where, where the, the, we get the, from the Greek, we get the name Christ or the word Christ. It's a title. And it means uh, the anointed one. And in Israel, the three offices that someone was anointed to take a position of was a prophet, was a priest, and was a king. And no one ever had all three positions. The only one that, has, that can have all three positions is the Christ. Because he is going to be Israel's, he came as Israel's prophet in his first coming. Through his death, he became Israel's high priest. And in his second coming, he's coming back to be king. So when they said the one who, they're, they're looking for this Messiah, the Christ to come. And he said, we found him. He, he's here. 
verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there, you know, he's, he's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And, and Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. <laughs> the Nazareth, you know, they're looking for a king. Naturally, you think a king would come out of Jerusalem. And, and, and if you know your history of the Old Testament, the ten northern tribes went into idolatry. And, and they even call, like up there, the, the land of Nethali, and so they call it the land of the Gentiles, because it's, when you get the further north, you get more mixture of Gentile in it. So the further north you go, the further away you get from the center of where God's attention is. So, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, he said, come and see. So it says, uh, uh, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said, unto, uh, said to, of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, When thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. This guy, not only is he a man of no guile, he's a man of absolute quick faith, isn't he? I mean, it, it, I mean the, in fact, look at verse 50. Jesus said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. <laughs> I mean, he's going to show greater signs, and there's going to be a whole bunch of people that aren't even going to believe the greater signs. Nathaniel was quick to faith. And, uh, and, 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 and so, but he acknowledged who Jesus Christ is. He is not just the son of Joseph in, in, the, in the sense that Joseph is his adopted father or stepfather, but he is the son of God. He understood, and by the way, the son of God is a term of deity, that you came from God. And so he knows he's God in flesh and that he's also the king of Israel. So the Lord told him, you're going to see greater things than this. And look what he says in verse 51. The Lord's talking to Nathanael, and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Oh, by the way, what does verily mean? Truly. truly. So he, he's, he said some things that were true, and he's, he's telling him twice here, that truly, truly, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So, why, is it, why are they... Ascending and descending, Jesus Christ came from heaven down to earth. Ultimately, he is going to be established king of Israel in Jerusalem. And when he's on earth as king of Jerusalem, look, look here's, here's, here's a, because there's, dispensationally, I think of this two different ways. And I'm not going to try to solve it right now, but look at Matthew. Now hold your place in Genesis, hopefully. <laughs> You're doing that. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 24 is a, a mini book of Revelation. <laughs> it, it, it's all about Christ's second coming. Matthew chapter 25 is how when he comes back, he's going to judge Israel, and they're going to give given assignments in the kingdom that he establishes. Then the last part of Matthew 25 is how he's going to judge the Gentiles, whether they get to enter into Israel's kingdom. And just like he told Abraham, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. Notice verse 34, Matthew 25 verse 34. Then shall the king say unto him, on, on them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you the foundation, from the foundation of the world. And they are asking, why are they blessed? And he says, because when I was hungry, you fed me. And they, they asked, you know, I'm abbreviating it. They asked him when. He said, when you did it to these, my brother, and you did it to me. By their treatment of Israel, these Gentile nations, some get blessed and get to enter into the kingdom, right? But then verse 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them that are on the left hand, Depart ye from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and the angels, for... When I was hungry, you gave me no meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. And they're going to ask him when. And, and uh, verse 44, and then they shall answer and say, Lord, when? And, and verse 45, then he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the, the least of these, ye did it not unto me. These his brethren. And so he's, the Gentiles get blessed by blessing Israel 
or they get cursed by cursing Israel. And this has to do with, like I said, Matthew 24 is the second coming of Christ. He's going to come back and set up his kingdom. And, and the Gentiles who, during that tribulation period that helped Israel, they're going to be allowed into the kingdom. The Gentile nations that went against Israel, followed the Antichrist against Israel. They're not going in the kingdom. Jesus Christ is going to wipe them off the earth. Now, I didn't come here to say all that. I came here to read verse 31. Chapter 25, verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and, there shall be, and, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, there's the Gentiles, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. So, that's why I told you this was all about how He's going to judge the Gentiles. But verse 31, when he returns, who comes with him? All the holy angels. And when he comes, he's going to sit on the throne of his glory. Where is the throne of his glory? He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to sit in Jerusalem. And if all the holy angels come with him, and yet their assignment is in heaven, they're going to come and report to the king, and then he, they're going to have to ascend into heaven, then they're going to have to descend to report to him, aren't they? That's when he establishes his kingdom. I, I'm surprised to see that in the, in, the millenn, in the beginning of the millennium. This is during the thousand year reign. Because after the thousand year reign, there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. Then there comes a new Jerusalem out of heaven and is established on the earth. And God, God is going to dwell on the earth. And that will become the eternal kingdom. And Jesus Christ will reign in the New Jerusalem, which is on the earth, but it's 1,500 miles high. It reaches into the heavens. And so he'll rule heaven and earth from the New Jerusalem that's going to be placed right there. In fact, it's going to take up the, the New Jerusalem bigger than that whole land mass right there. So when you, when you talk about the size of it, it's huge. But, uh, but it, God's throne is going to be established in the earth. The earth is an important planet <laughs> in, in the heavens that God created. And, uh, and, and, but anyhow, all that to say why it says the angels are going to ascend and then descend. Because when he is king and he sits on the throne of his glory, the angels come there to report to him, just like the people of the earth will come there to report to him. You can read that in Isaiah chapter 66. Now, go back to Genesis 28. <clears throat> Jacob has this dream. And again, I'll read verse 13 again. It says, And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he's sitting here in Bethel having this dream, and he says, to the north, to the south, to the east, nope, yeah, that's to the east, <laughs> and to the west, all that land, that's going to be yours as an everlasting possession, to thy seed after thee, and in thee and in thy seed after thee. And that in, in thy seed after thee is both the multiplied seed and also the, one of the multiplied seed is the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, through which all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God reiterates that promise and it's going to go to Jacob. Verse 15 it says, And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. Now remember where he's on his way. He's actually going to leave the land. He's going up to Haran. He's going up to, um, well, that's the Persia area later on in, well, uh, and it says, And I will bring thee again unto this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So God promised him, I'm going to fulfill this, I'm going to be with you, even when you go off the land, when you come back to the land, I'm going to fulfill these, this promise to you, that you're, I'm going to be with you in all places wherever you go. So God's going to protect him and, and give him that land. And remember, Esau's mad at him, planned to kill him. But God's promising, you're going to come back to this land, and you're going to come back in peace. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And notice this last part. And I knew it not. All this time that he's been fighting for the inheritance of his father, it has been a pure physical thing. It has, he has not recognized the fact 
that the true God, the Most High God, made a promise to Abraham, made a promise to Isaac, and now made a statement that the elder will serve the younger. The younger is going to be the recipient of this Abrahamic covenant. God, Isaac promised it to him, now God promised it to him, and then he realized, <laughs> God's in this place, and I never knew it. He didn't realize that there, there was more than just a physical, you know, his, his, Abraham was very rich, Isaac very rich. But here, this is, this is now spiritual. And, and he didn't know it. All this time that he was trying to get this inheritance, it wasn't out of a matter of faith or respect to God. Now he realized that this, this place is a very special place to God. I keep pointing here. Bethel is where he's at right there. And, and so he's realizing that God is in that place. It says uh, um, in verse 17, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and, and this is the gate of heaven. Well, certainly you would understand that there is a connection where this land connects heaven and earth. That's the latter, he just saw it. That that is the place where heaven's got his eyes on and is connected to the earth and will be literally connected in the New Jerusalem someday. And so that is a, a real special place, and it's, he calls it the house of God and the gate of heaven. And in verse 18, and Jacob rose early in, in the morning and took the stone that he had made for pillows and set them up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that place, uh, 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 that, of that city, was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Now he's making a vow here, but notice it's almost a vow that, well, I'm not quite accepting the Lord yet. Abraham, in that place, called on the name of the Lord, didn't he? He kind of settled some issues between him and God. But Jacob, he realizes that place is special, but he's going to wait for God to keep his word. That he's going to go away to Iran, and if he comes back in peace, then he says, God will be my God. And the stones which I have set up for a pillar shall, God, shall, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give, thee, uh, give a tenth unto thee. So he knew how to tithe, just like Abraham with Melchizedek. Uh, but that's all what he's going to do in the future. And... Uh, but when he says in verse 22, And the stones which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, that's what the name Bethel means, the house of God. And, and so that it used to be called Luz. Now they're calling this place Bethel because that place is the house of God. And, and it's the gate of heaven. And, and so he recognizes that place. Now, Come over to, uh, well, we read all that. Come to chapter 32. We're going to, we're not really studying Jacob's life. The time that he spent in Haran, he married actually two different daughters and then had children even with their, their, uh, uh, with their, their servants. Uh, and then, so he's multiplying, you don't have, to have 12 kids yet, but he's multiplying kids. And, and then, then he, works, he works seven years for one wife, seven years for another wife, and, go ahead. Oh, I was trying to figure out what laws meant. Oh, okay. I actually was trying to find out what the Hebrew of laws meant. I don't know if that's the same or not. <laughs> I can't hardly speak English. <laughs> uh, anyhow, in Jacob's life, he, he, he's up in Haran, and he's been there some 14, going on 21 years. And he uh, has worked for seven years for each daughter, and then he's working for uh, his own possessions. He made a deal with his uncle up there, Laban, that that uh, all the spatted co cattle that he would get, and he learned how to breed the cattle so that every time they had cattle, it would become his, <laughs> and that was his wages. 
then Laban's son said, wait a minute, we're being cheating out of our inheritance. And they kind of get mad at Jacob. And Jacob says to his wives, I think it's time for me to move back home. <laughs> and so they, they leave and they had to escape to do so. Uh, I'm going to have to do this fast. Uh, anyhow, on the way back, now they got Laban and his brothers chasing after Jacob because he's taken all the, the possessions with him when they go. And as he's coming home, Esau is coming up to meet him. And remember, last Esau said, is, I'm going to kill him. So he's got both families. He's between a rock and a hard place. And he actually, I don't have time to show you, he, comes, he goes right back to this place here where Abraham first entered into that land. There it is. And he gets to that point, and that's where we are in verse 32. Oh, boy. I'll tell you what, I'll have to fill in verse 32 later. Jump. This is where he wrestles with God, and in verse 29 of chapter 32, and Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou ask, me, ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. So the place he's wrestling, wrestling with God, he's, he realizes he's wrestling with God. I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And it was there that... Uh, the verses above is that God says your name is no longer, verse 28 there, Jacob, but your name is going to be changed to Israel. Now, just because the bell's going to ring, maybe we can fill in next week. Get over to chapter 33 and verse 18. And Jacob came, oh, okay, he wasn't at Shalom yet, I forgot. Here's where he comes to Shalom. Shalom is that place. He gets, he's, he's coming back, his brother's chasing him, his uncle's after him, somewhere to the north they have that incident. He gets to this place here. And it says, And Jacob came to Shalom, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came, uh, when, when he came from Paden Aram and pitched his tent before the city, and he brought, bought a parcel of the field which he had, uh, which he had uh, spread, uh, which he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El. Elohi Israel. El is the name God, or is the title God. Elohi is now you see another God again. So it's God, the God of, and then you see the word Israel. I, I missed reading the verse 32. What verse is it that he says changes his name to Israel? It's not jumping at me. There's another place he says that. Yeah, verse 38, 28 of chapter 32. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For a prince hast thou had power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. God changed na Jacob's name to Israel. Israel gets to this place where Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And what does he say there? He builds an altar and calls it El Elohi Israel, the God, the God of Israel. He called on the name of the Lord, didn't he? Remember he said, if you bring me back in peace, that wrestling, he entered in peace. His uncle goes away, his brother comes and greets him, and they have a family reunion rather than death sentence. And, and then he goes to this place where Abraham was, and he calls on the name of the Lord and, and calls it God, the God of Israel. He's my God. He's come back in peace. The next thing you know, he's going to leave there and come to Bethel. <laughs> we'll pick up and cover some of that next week as we're going to jump all the way from Genesis to the book of Joshua and, tra and talking about that land because after the end of Genesis they're going to end up in Egypt, right? We don't care about that. When he comes back again then we care about that so we'll end up picking up in Joshua. So that's an important chapter there, isn't it? And let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and and the, the reality of what's going to happen here on this planet in that particular place where fighting occurs all the time, even in our day, when, when your eyes aren't even on that place. And yet it will become an important place, and so there's still battles that take place there and satanic influence that tries to fill that land. And Father, we thank you that your, your calling for us is heaven and, uh, and that the things that you promised will be fulfilled and that we live in a world that has a witness uh, of what your purpose is uh, right on the front pages of the newspaper, but most of all in the passages of Scripture like we read today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.